Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're joined by a couple of folks from Discovery Garden who are going to show off exploring decoupled applications with Island Aura 8. So I'd like to say welcome to Morgan Daw, who is a senior developer at DGI, and Jordan Ducart, who's a software architect. And they've prepared quite a show for you today, so I'm going to turn it over to them. And we'll have um, about 20 minutes at the end of it, hopefully, for questions. So please do save up your questions for the end. You can type them into the chat. All right. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Uh, so like Melissa mentioned, today we're going to be talking about exploring the couple applications with Island Aura 8. And yeah, just introductions again. I'm Jordan Ducart. I'm a software architect at DGI. I have eight plus years of Island Door and Drupal experience. And I know way too yeah. much about exact moment OAI yeah. yeah. PMA spec than we'll ever need. Uh, Morgan, can you mute, please? <laughs> and oh, Morgan yeah. will be joining me. And he's got six plus years of Island Door and Drupal experience. And his focus is on Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 theming. So just to give a quick overview about DGI, for those of you who may not be aware of who we are, um, we were founded in 2010 out of the Island Aura project at uh, UPI. And we managed the project until the formation of the Island Aura Foundation in 2013. Uh, to date, we've performed more than 500 installations for over 200 projects. Cumulatively, our staff has more than 100 years of combined experience in Island Aura, digital repositories, and preservation. And we've helped clients protect over 100 million files. So just to give a quick overview and the agenda for today's talk, um, we're going to talk about what is decoupled and why approach problems this way. How does Drupal implement decoupled architecture, specifically with JSON API? Uh, Morgan will do a simple demo of integrating Island Aura objects into a decoupled app with React using JSON, uh, Drupal's JSON API implementation. And finally, we'll talk about what we're doing at DJI with the coupled architecture. So what is decoupled? So decoupled is the separation of the front end presentation layer from the data stored in the back end. So in Drupal's case, Drupal acts as a back end only content management system that the front end accesses via an API. In traditional Drupal, it's monolithic and it's coupled by nature. So it does provide powerful tools for content creation, management, workflow, taxonomies, et cetera. Uh, but with that, it maintains complete control over the presentation and data layers. And historically, Island Dora, at least in my opinion, has really only ever utilized the data layer. Um, it's kind of changed a little bit towards Island Dora 8, where as things are now modeled as entities, we kind of get more you know, Drupal integration. Um, but with the kind of previous points, it does have a steep learning curve. So most people have more experience with front-end JavaScript frameworks than understanding of Drupal's theme layer. So why decoupled? Like why may you approach your problems this way? So right off the gate, you do see kind of benefits in performance. Uh, static site generators become a possibility. So for those of you unfamiliar with what a static site generator is, essentially it takes a snapshot of your content when the site is built and stores it locally. And because it's static and that content's not going to change, you can heavily cache it and put it behind a CDN. So some examples of this are Gatsby, Jekyll, Forestry, et cetera. Um, similarly, you do get some security benefits, especially in the static site case, um, because there's no direct access to your back end. Or in even a more decoupled scenario, your access is very uh, obfuscated. And then it does, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it has an ease of use for developers. So it reduces complexity, and you don't really have to know about all the Drupalisms. And then probably the biggest point or the biggest kind of benefit that you see is you get a lot of flexibility. So one source of data can be used in many different ways to present tailored experiences to your end users. So if your back end, we'll say repository in the Islandora case, is decoupled, it's kind of your source of truth but maybe you have a mobile app that needs specific branding, or you have a example exhibit that you want to make of some of your objects. All of these things can be built separately, but still pull from the same source of data. And with that, your front-end framework, like any front-end framework rather, can be used that supports pulling from HTTP APIs or GraphQL. So I'm going to talk quickly about Drupal's approach to decoupled. It really kind of started off with a whiskey initiative 
which aim to transform Drupal from a monolithic uh, CMS to a REST server with a CMS on top of it. That began as early as 2009, but it began really taking shape in February of 2012. And for reference, uh, Drupal 8's release was in November of 2015. So this was one of their big goals moving into Drupal 8. And that's going to continue on now with the API First initiative. Um, its goal is making data stored and managed by Drupal available over HTTP APIs. And that's spearheaded from members of Acquia and Lullabot and other big um, organizations. So with Drupal, there's kind of different types of decoupling. And there's a couple really good resources in the slide deck here of articles written by Dre's. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with who Dre's is, he is the creator of Drupal and the founder of Acquia. But he lays out kind of the different types of decoupling and when you may approach your project in that way there's a nice handy flow chart, but that's linked later in the description. So we'll talk about progressively decoupled, where this is the more traditional sense where a Drupal theme layer, layer is still used for the initial rendering. Uh, so in eight, you're still rendering everything with Twig, but maybe your blocks are being pulled in with, say, React. And then you do have your fully decoupled static site, which is going back previously. You use Drupal as your data source, and then you deploy that, say, with your Jam stack or whatever you want to do there. And what we'll be talking about today and kind of showing off will be an example of a fully decoupled app where Drupal is primarily used for a content repository for other consumers. So with this, Drupal Core itself provides a few modules to accomplish this. So there's how, serialization, REST, basic auth, and JSON API. So what is JSON API? And it's defined as a specification for building APIs in JSON, and it really is what it says on the tin. So defines how a client should request resources and how a server should respond to those requests. In Drupal's case, it's acting as the uh, server. And its main goal is designed to minimize the amount of requests and the amount of data transmitted. So quickly, I'll segue and talk about GraphQL. Um, GraphQL is an open source data query and manipulation language. It was created by Facebook in 2012, and it's now maintained by a nonprofit foundation. Um, it does kind of have the same general goal. Um, however, you know, depending on the requirements for your project, you could go one way or the other. Uh, it is perfectly viable, regardless of what I'm about to talk about with it. And you know, in another article by Dre's, it does lay out when you may want to leverage one versus the other. So just keep that in mind. And primarily, we went with JSON API for what we're doing, uh, right now at least, um, because it is in Drupal core. So uh, the features of JSON API, it allows for the inclusion of related content in a single request. So an example of this would be you ingest an Alondor object, and then you want to fetch you know, the user information of the person who created it. As Drupal, at its heart, is a denormalized de database architecture, in a standard kind of REST API, you would need to make one request for your object and then one request for the user's ID, or rather, sorry, the user entity with the user's ID from the object. With JSON API or GraphQL, you can kind of combine these into a singular request. Uh, with JSON API, it's cache flow out of the box because it's built into HTTP. GraphQL has no caching for queries out of the box. There is some kind of community adopted approaches to leverage this with persistent queries or you could look at doing it locally with, say, Apollo client. Um, but with that in mind, JSON API becomes less complex than GraphQL. Um, because it's a querying language at its heart, um, it does have an HT implementation, but there is still some kind of uptake and learning to get used to the syntax of how to you know, denote and define GraphQL queries. And mutations and write operations are constant for each operation. Uh, so talking about Drupal's JSON API module, it's zero configuration. So if you get a new installation of Drupal core, it already exists. The only thing you have to do is enable it. The only setting is allowing full CRUD, uh, create, read, update, and delete, versus just read. Um, and starting out, it was the contrib module. And as of Drupal 8.7, it's actually bundled in core. Um, how it works is it inspects your entity types and bundles to dy dynamically provide resources to access each using standard HTTP methods. So the uh, node Islandora uh, entity or content type and bundle becomes node slash Islandora object. 
And all requests require the content type header of application VND API JSON. Uh, some things to note, which is actually really quite nice about this implementation, is that field specific configuration is respected when you make your requests. So, for example, if you wanted to create a new Islandora object and inside your content type, you've denoted that the description field is required. That field must be present in the body of your post when you go to create it. Otherwise, the request won't succeed. It does throw a nice 400 area with a very verbose error message. Another thing here, similarly, is that all service level actions that trigger normally through Drupal still happen when you make your request. So if you ingest yourself an image object, you're still going to get a service made with Crayfish. So here's just a list of some of the contrib modules that exist out there to kind of enhance the core experience. I won't really touch on individually what these things do. There's obviously a lot more. These are just some of the ones that have come across my path when we've been working on what we're doing. And at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Morgan, and he's going to talk a little bit about Postman and then get into the hands-on demo. Thank you, Jordan. I'm taking over the screen now. Sorry to wait. OK. All right. Now, as Jordan had mentioned earlier, my name is Morgan Daw. I'm a senior developer here at Discovery Garden. I've been working here for six plus years and began my role as a developer and have been migrating and working my way towards front end development and I'm enjoying every step of the way. So with our presentation here today, I'd like to start talking about Postman. And the reason I do that is fairly obvious using JSON API to make our requests. It's also helpful to have a place where we can test out these requirements, maybe craft our queries in a more sane little sandbox. And that's what Postman lets us do. As I'll be using it today, it's a standalone application on Mac, but has plugins for different browsers as well, like Google Chrome and Firefox. So this enables a developer like yourself and myself to uh, collaborate with a team by building collections of queries, which we can kind of share around. Now, the webinar uh, repository we have on GitHub, which will be available after the presentation, has a collection baked into it as well. And I'll show you that here in a few minutes. But the purpose of it is to kind of get you up and running, uh, inspecting responses, real world responses, without actually having to build anything out. This is an example of a JSON API response, uh, just a JSON object, essentially. And in our query example here, we're asking for all of the data as it pertains to an Islandora object. Now you'll notice we're specifying the particular object via the UUID. So we can return things like attributes and relationships of the target node. Now, given the data model of Islandora objects, this works particularly well with one or two, excuse me, one or two exceptions. And that might come into play when say you might be used to working with something like an article, which has an embedded image in, via the content type or something like that. Of course, uh, we're using the media bundles and taxon returns and relationships, so things are slightly different. In addition to making one query, one request for an object, we're also going to have to ask for all of the related media content for it. So the, the data that describes a node, as well as relationships, attributes, and any other included content we want to bring back in our query. Here's a few more examples of the JSON API requests. Uh, the first one simply returns all content as it pertains to Islandora objects, that is, all created nodes that are of the Islandora object uh, content type, essentially. So we talked about it a bit more earlier, but the Islandora object via UUID get request is seen here as well, which will return simply a single object via, via a single UUID. But the JSON API allows you to extend and use things uh, that we're not quite used to using in something like REST, for example, or, or any other framework like that. So we're using, in this case, filters as an example. We can have out-of-the-box functionality that lets us request an Islandora object or a list of them and loop over them and uh, specify that we're looking for a particular object with filters. Say we're looking for a field value, a field of this, say field title, with a value of that uh, my object title. This allows us to get uh, creative in our query crafting. So when you see the Postman queries a little bit later on, you understand that this is just a starting point. 
a place for you to construct and build more complicated queries as your application requires them. In addition, filters also allow you to have uh, conditional operators and conditional filtering. We have an example on the screen here where I've labeled my filter, my filter label, and include the required conditions in this case. We're looking for a path, operator, and value. The path is referring to where in the JSON request, you can think of it anyway, where in the JSON request, that our path should be pointing to in the operator that will be applied to it. In this case, we're looking for field first name with an operator is equal to a value of Janus. Now, you'll probably notice that there's a URL encoded equal sign there. And that's for obvious reasons, when we're using a, uh, special characters like this, we'll have to be careful to ensure that they're that the URL encoded properly so we can get our responses back as we expect them. Now there are a number of conditions that are available for use with the JSON API filters. And I would encourage you to explore them all. We have a list of them there on the right hand side, somewhat shamelessly taken from Drupal.org. As you can see, you can do a lot of different queries, including date range queries, something, say, a date between this and that date for a given number of articles that were created. So it's particularly useful when uh, following the whole mentality of reducing the number of queries you want to make in order to power your front end application. The JSON API also has some pretty fun uh, workable things like includes. The includes parameter. It, is what we will use to specify to include additional relationships within a single um, query request. In the example below, we're asking for an Omdra object for any given UUID, and we're asking it to include field comments that might be uh, related to that node. So retrieving the relationship, the comments between the object and the node. So we can work with that in our uh, decoupled front end application and still kind of reduce the number of queries we're using by using these includes and working with the standardized same JSON response object, which has a top layer of like data, links, and then the includes. So you can work with exactly what you expect. Today, my hope is to show off a bit of this integration tactic by using a front end uh, application built with Create React App and React.js. Simply put, React.js is just a framework like any other that would allow one to create a reusable user interface that is standardized and decoupled from the data providing backend, the content management system that is Drupal 8. Now, this is particularly useful in that we can reuse all of these components. So parts like a header, footer, or other interactive elements become written in JavaScript and are kind of condensed so that we can reuse them in different places, particularly easy so that when we retrieve our data from the back end at Drupal 8, that is, we uh, build it up into a, a same little object that represents a title, UUID, path, things like that. And we can pass it around to these different components that are expecting these, these different values. So that when we reuse these components, they start making a lot of sense and they're kind of boiled down into the very basis of what they need. So, Components will be initially rendered and re-rendered as required, as noted there, by using class-based React.js components. So we can take advantage of the uh, React state component. <coughs> Excuse me. So Create React App itself is just a command line interface tool. And it's one that allows us to create simple React standalone, normal, normally uh, single page applications with very little to no configuration. Uh, for our purposes today, we're going to make sure that we have the node version six or above as it's required to use a create React app. And it's recommended to use the NPM 5.2 or greater. And this just allows us to utilize the NPX package runner so that we can build, run, start, stop, excuse me, start, and inspect the additional scripts that come with the create React app directive. Now, we're setting up a new project with Create React App really couldn't be simpler. We just have to make sure that our prerequisites, as I just mentioned, are installed and, and available. And next, we'll create a directory for using npx create react app and your project's name. This will kick off a series of events that will download project requirements, create default files for you, 
and set up a little uh, server running that can serve your application. Now, when, after we create the project name, we can view the available scripts by going into the directory and choosing the npm run. Uh, particular script we're looking at today, as this is a very basic example, simply npm start, which kicks off the server for local development and for testing. I'll be using this during the sample application we put together. Now the Create React app, as I said, directive will create a number of files for you. But in our case, we're going to be looking at three in particular. And I'll start with the package.json. Out of the box, when you create a app using Create React app, there are uh, only three individual dependencies, uh, React, React DOM, and React scripts. But our application that I'll be walking through today will require a little bit more than that. Not much more, but a little bit more. In our case, it'll be using a small file ky, which is a tiny HTTP client for making client-based fetch API calls on the JavaScript side of things. It's not absolutely necessary to use in your project. I simply use it to put together a small API JSON file to kind of make that the file as small and condensed as, excuse me, as possible. Next, we're also going to be taking advantage of JSONA, which is another library installed via NPM, which allows us to provide different data formatters for working with JSON and JavaScript. And depending on how you're building your application, this isn't always required either. But I did include a big for ease of use, and it's, I do like you working with it. So uh, beyond that, our app.js and our index.js are created for us as well. The index.js is where the code really kind of begins and where it comes to a head. This work is, uh, it, this is where our application is actually rendered using the reactom.render function. Then this is where it's attaching our app to the document root. Typically created for you by default, the hashtag root, but it really could be anything you like as your application develops you may want to change this. We'll take a look at this in a moment. And finally, app.js file. This is where we kind of want to pull everything in together. The index.js will take advantage of the app.js. So any subcomponents we might make, including the one we'll be building a little later today, will be imported into the app.js and rendered there. Okay, now, the goals of the sample project I'm about to present I'm going to be building a single page React.js application. It's a simple read-only front-end view of all the objects that I have in my backend. Now, this will demonstrate the Drupal JSON API uh, integration, and we'll be spitting out some data from the console logs to see exactly what comes back from that. And furthermore, to achieve this look out of the box relatively easily, I'm going to be using a community-provided masonry component, a React masonry component, which I'll be showing you in just a moment. And this is an example of what we hope to achieve by the end of this small application. There's not much here. There's a lot that could be done, including pagination. You could have posts and update requests. But for the purposes of our demonstration, we'll be building a simple Git request app that will just show and link back to objects we have in our backend, in my backend, I should say. So without further ado, let's write some code. I'm going to minimize this now, and I'm hoping that everyone is still able to see my screen. Um, before I go any further into the React side of things, let's first take a look at the sandbox that I have up running in the cloud. I'm con currently connected to a VPN in the office, and I have a, a IH sandbox running there, which has all of my sample content in it. The content that, I look, that I'm looking to pull down for this React application is available here. We're using a fairly standard, straightforward uh, Drupal theme that built in house, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is what we're looking at here. We're looking at the thumbnails, we're looking at the names of the objects and presented in a, in a basic grid kind of way. But I'd like to do this using a masonry component. So. I'll be taking these, making a request to this JSON API endpoint, which is my Drupal backend, pulling that content together and putting it into my React application. Before I go there, I'm just going to mention that, as Jordan did point out, there, there's only one real module involved here, and that's just the JSON API module. 
not pulling that up. And now it was mentioned that there is very, very little configuration involved. And for my configuration, I'm simply configuring it to only read operations. So I'm not doing creates or updates or deletes. I'm not using CRUD operations. This example is just using read operations to pull content and show it in the front end. Now, that said, I'll return to my home page. And one more thing before I go, start coding that is, I also set up a cores file on my server so that we can, uh, so that my server will accept my Git requests. It's documented on the readme in the, um, on the webinar we have application we have up on GitHub, which will be available after we're finished here. But I just wanted to stress that it's not a good idea to take that course file configuration as you see it and use it in a production server. It's simply set up as a demonstration and we'll be accepting all requests. In the real world, you want to take that JSON, or excuse me, you'll want to take that file and limit it down to the applications that should have access to it. So without further ado, I'm going to switch back to my development here, and we'll take a look at what I'm going to be building. So I, we've gone through this run before, and using NPX, um, NPM Create React app, it takes a little bit of time just to download all the requirements. So I've gone ahead and done this already for us. I've set up the basic structure of what we'll be using to integrate the masonry component that we'll be taking a look at here in just a moment. Before I go that far, I did make mention that there is a Postman collection that you can use to build and craft your own queries. And that's included within the Postman uh, di uh, directory on GitHub with this project. Now, this isn't particularly human readable, but this is what it looks like. When I pull this up, we have an Andro webinar aptly named collection, which has some taxonomy and read Git requests. Now, where you can retrieve all objects as well, but I wanted to highlight this type of query crafting. You can create as many conditional filters as you like and kind of add them together, and you can inspect the response to kind of prepare yourself and the application for the data that is to come. In this case, I'm using the field media use dot name taxonomy term thumbnail image to retrieve what I want from a particular UUID that represents an Android object. Now, once you see I use the include, excuse me, directive, I can expand the data and see the full contents of my query results, but I can check out the includes uh, JSON object that comes back, JSON array, which links back to the uh, thumbnail that I requested. So as we see here, it's just points back to the thumbnail. It's pretty convenient. There's a lot of, uh, Real room in here, a lot of things you can do to play with. This just returns all the media images. There's a lot of different things you can do, but I wanted to point out that the collections is available on GitHub, and this is what it looks like. You can use it to get models, and as you see, it's really just focused around the getting side of things and not so much around uh, posts, puts, deletes, or updates, things like that. So that's going to require a little bit of self learning, but at the same time, this should get you up and running relatively. Now, beyond that uh, Postman collection that's included within this application. Now, there's a few different ways in which to integrate uh, uh, environmental variables like this. For example, some have suggested that you could even do it within the package.json file. But for our demonstration here today, I've set up the .env file, which has two of our required environmental variables. One, of course, where is my data set? Where am I requesting data from? And the other is simply looking for that JSON API endpoint. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see it's simply slash JSON API. And there are modules out there you can install in Drupal to change that. But I don't see a need to do that right now as uh, Drupal 8 and JSON API uses kind of evolve. We won't really be uh, focused on changing that right now. So I'm going to take a quick peek at what this looks like when I hit that endpoint. Excuse me. So in my browser, it doesn't present it as pretty as it might be in the Postman. But here we can see all of the Allendor entities and how they're described. And we can see links that describe them more. So in this case, I could choose to follow the menu. And I could see what kind of data comes back for that term that defines the menu. It gives us a lot to work with. 
Let me close this out and head back to the home page just for sanity's sake. And now I'm going to switch back to my React development environment. I currently have my React uh, up and running already, running on my local hosts. I simply ran the directives to uh, create my React app and chose npm start. And beyond that, I've also added some very basic utility components, which I've already covered. The environment, uh, the environment variables, excuse me, as well as a utilities file. I'm going to run through this utilities file because it's included here because crafting this type of thing on the fly during a live demo might take a little bit of time and is somewhat precarious. It's not overly difficult to work with, but just the same, I thought it might help to save some time. Those two optional dependencies I mentioned earlier, KY, JSON, A, are being implemented in this one file. So if you choose to fork or extend or change this project in the future, this is where you can change it. And it's all really happening within a single Drupal client request. Now, this API.js file has a single entry point that my app is going to be taking advantage of. To do that, the default app.js file that was created uh, with my Create React app has been somewhat rewritten. Instead of using a singular function component, we see that this is now an extending a class of React.component. Now we do that so we can take advantage of state data because we're going to be using real world information that we're pulling back from the server. We want a place to put it and we want a place where it can uh, be used to re-render the application if this data or JSON API requests are ever made again. So we'll use this so it kind of bubbles down and re-renders as required. In this case, it shouldn't necessarily be necessary, but working with classes, I find is preferable. So we initialize state just by kicking off the constructor and calling super. And there we just set the state to a JSON object, which has a data array within it. Now, the typical way of making fetch requests is to simply write out your fetch here with a dot then and dot then. But to kind of keep the components as small as possible and the work that's actually contacting the back end uh, compartmentalized, I've added this single React app data function call which will call uh, asynchronous, asynchronously, excuse me, our Drupal client request in the background and returns a promise. So we have to wait. We have to wait for that to come back before we can proceed with creating the rest of our data or creating the rest of our application. So at this point with my application running, we should be able to see the content that comes back. But I'm gonna take a quick look at the React app data function call first within the API.js. This is doing two things, really. It's getting all the Angular object JSON data, and, and it's cleaning it up, essentially. Finally, we're making our separate requests for the media and state data. Um, I'm doing media and state data within the same function, but this could still be broken out. The Angular object JSON object function call is making a simple uh, HTTP request for this data uh, via Drupal client and waiting for its response and returning it. From there, we're just cleaning up the client data that returns from that request using the clean object data function call, which is fairly simple stuff. It's mapping what comes back in JSON to a same local name that I like to use in my app, say object.title, I'll call it a name. So anything else that comes back in that JSON object, I can kind of map it back. And we see I've created an HTTP or uh, URL source for the object in question. So we can view the object, click on it, and actually see it in its production environment in the back end, if you so choose. And finally, we're getting the median state data in this function call, which consists of another asynchronous request. So that means we're up to two at this point for all of the data we're about to use. Now, we're building out the filters as we see here, field media op.id, and building out conditions and operators and values in much the same way that we have done in Postman, or that I've showed you in Postman. Well, this example is only using a single UUID. We're using the programmatic functions of JavaScript to kind of build this up dynamically and join them together with our ampersand. So we can make a single request for all of that data for all of those objects in a single function call. Now, this is being built a little backwards so that a little later on, we can map these together and build out a state data array, which has the content we, have, we require uh, we're using the media up that ID to kind of point things back to where we need them to be once we build up the state data. So essentially, 
We're making one function call in here. It's getting all the onder object data. And for all of those onder object UUIDs, we're building up another uh, query using the filters uh, and a filter condition of thumb filter to make sure we get our thumbnail image returned back as well. And that's mapped back to our state data and finally returned. So with this single file, we're making two function calls, two JSON API function calls, cleaning up the response and returning it to our application for later use. So with that said, I'm gonna jump back to the app.js and actually start integrating this masonry component. I've chosen to, to build the React masonry component using NPM, and I've already gone ahead and installed that for us so we don't have to wait around watching my screen install masonry components. But I've simply followed the directions that were laid out here. In my case, I just use NPM install React masonry component. And now we can go ahead and utilize that React Masonry component in my application. So I'm interested in using the most bare bones, simple approach I can. So I'm gonna take this as it is and copy it into my project by creating a new component. Switch back to my component. And now I'm gonna to add to the source a new components directory. I like to try and keep components organized within their own directories. And I'll add my masonry now. Because it's a masonry component, it makes sense. And finally, I'll add my masonry file. There you go. And I'm not going to add it to GitHub today. So I'm just going to paste in what we just grabbed from the masonry DAC component npm page, as it tells us that we have to use something like this for its most basic interpretation. So I'm going to go ahead and fill this out. But before I do, I'm going to get rid of the images loaded option since we don't actually need it and not in this demo. And I'm going to change my grid class to simply grid. Seems to make a bit more sense to me. And I like working with divs. This is not going to be an unordered list. So by default, it's bringing back an unordered list. I'm going to change this to a div. Get rid of this information. Right now. It'll be something like that in the end. But before I go any further, I'm going to grab the masonry options that I need from viewing the masonry JS page. The NPM package doesn't make any assumptions about how you want to work with your data. So we have to go to the masonry page at danferio.com, which is available in the Ango React component that we have on GitHub. And I'm interested in building the responsive layout option here. So there's some CSS and some DOM elements that are required. So I'm going to grab the masonry items that I need here define it. And this is just using a JSON, excuse me, a jQuery to initialize the JavaScript Mason. But the options remain the same. So I'll just grab this and I'll quickly add this to my Mason options with comments. And we'll see that our item selector has to be grid item or whatever we change it to. And our grid sizer, something that's used an empty DOM element if you're familiar working with Mason it uses this to determine the width of a column typically. And from that, we specify in the app's CSS file how wide those columns should be. So, without any further ado, I'm going to grab that. I think it is here. Yep. A quick little grid sizer. And we have a grid item will be here. And I'll put my sizer within the masonry layout. Now it's an empty DOM right now, but it will be using this to, with all the child elements that I eventually build out here from the properties that are props, I should say, that are passed down this React component. So uh, React also likes it when you give uh, the base DOM element a key when you're working with the component. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. And I know from my JSON API example, that I'm getting the image source, the name, the path, and the UUID. So the unique identifier here would work well for a key. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Racery.js, we're mapping elements to elements. So I'll use element.d. That's my key. And for the purposes of styling, I'm going to have a few inner wrappers here, I think. Forgive me as I type, I can't quite type and talk at the same time. Yeah. 
Now we have a wrapper set up with some basal classes that we can use for styling. Here's where we're actually going to start mapping those elements that came down from our properties to something we can actually see and use and work with. So I'm going to choose first to wrap uh, my image in an anchor tag. So I'd like to reference back the source data. So I'm going to take rest back to that. Excuse me. I'm not mistaken. Open this up in a new window. So target. And because we're opening in a new window, React will complain if we don't use the rel no open or no refer directive. So I'll toss it in real quick. Excuse me. So we have our anchor set up. So let's toss in our image now, which should have been coming back from our data. So our image source will map to the element dot image source. It was documented in here, image source. Yes. Give it this alt. But now yes. we could map back to element dot name, and I'll give it a title as well. This will pull back our image, and that's great. But let's go ahead and give this a name, title, something to look at. In this case, I'm simply going to map this back to our element dot name as well. And this should be just about all we need for this React component. And we do have to make sure we import it and utilize it properly and pass the data down to this React component. But let's do that now. I'll jump back to my app.js, and now I'm going to import that new component that this made. Excuse me. Importing gallery from my dot slash components directly. So now we have the component pulled in. We have the state data, which should be pulled back as well. We can actually console.log that. Well, should be a old habits that kind. Now if I jump back to my React app, I inspect the element and quickly reload the page. Down from the never used. And now we have our state data that comes back. It's all mapped out into individual objects that I want to map for display, use, and make some point. So I'm going to go ahead and set that up now by passing this data into my inner React component. You should be able to do that by initializing gallery and passing in the element data that it requires. In this case, elements, if I'm not mistaken, should be pointing to this state of data. So we did see also that within the masonry layout, we had to specify some CSS. So before we go look at what this app might look like, quick tour of the CSS file. Most of this is built by default for you. There's a spinning React icon and create an app with great React app. But the rest of it is all mostly just sugar with the exception of the grid sizer and grid item. I've given the grid a max width and margin just to center it. And the grid image, that, like I said, Masonry doesn't make any uh, predeterminations about how you want to present your data. So if you don't want images overflowing outside of the grid, you kind of have to give it a little bit of styling as well. And that's what I've done here. So my app should be saved. And if I return to my React component, we now see all of these images that were once viewable here on my back end are now quickly available on my front end, which is a standard decoupled standard React single page application. So, and it's responsive too, which is not too bad in the box. One more thing before I go. Uh, this is technically functionally complete. Let's take one more look at the data that comes back from the Hangul objects within my API uh, request. So I might be more interested in these objects if I could learn more about them with a quick referral glance. So maybe I could use the description. So I under objects have the field underscore description uh, field on it. So I'm going to go ahead and create this uh, entry for my application to use. I'm going to choose, uh, I'm, I'm just going to call it DESC for now. And I'll map the Alendra object data, as we see here, title, ID, 
to field underscore descriptions. Excellent. So now I save that and reload the page. Take a look at my quick con my console here. Oh, there we go. So I put it away and I pop this open. There, we see that we have a description that's now being mapped back as well from the JSON object that represents the entirety of a single island. So I'm going to grab this description and I'm finally going to put it underneath the title. Let's kind of wrap things up. Make sure the point in place. And I'll just add to it. Then I'll pop in the element.desc, which I just created. And if live reload gets baked into the act that we should now see all this content pop up with the description that appears underneath it. There you go. So this kind of brings us to the conclusion of the demonstration of the single standalone React application. And with that, I'm going to switch back to the slides. I've kind of lost my place here. I'll bring these slides back up. There we go. And now uh, we're moving on to connecting our app to the JSON API and to talk a little bit more about what's to come. I'm going to hand things back off to Jordan. All right. Uh, hopefully, you guys can uh, see my screen again. And uh, Morgan kind of went over this really quickly, but I'll just har harp on some points real quick. So, uh, with JSON API, you do have your choice of authentication. So, um, out of the box, like I said earlier, basic auth ships with Drupal core. Uh, simple OAuth is the more recommended approach. Um, but any Drupal authentication provider service will work. So what Morgan showed off in the demo there was going with no auth because he didn't have to because it was this read only of public objects. Uh, so again, just to reiterate what he kind of mentioned there, uh, given Islandor 8's data modeling, it's very much mapping Drupal entities now. So you can use JSON API out of the box with the one caveat that Morgan touched on there where most common Drupal data modeling has any references from the parent to the child. So an example of that would be the field model, which represents the content model in Islandora 8. Um, however, media uh, in Islandora references upwards from the child to the parent. Um, while it does support the same piece of media being referenced multiple times, it unfortunately requires a separate request to get it by default with JSON and API. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to talk about today, it's kind of like what we're doing at DJI with Decoupled. And what I'll show off is kind of a uh, front end that's streamlined to for managerial tasks for the end user. Supports full crowd of Alandora objects. And there's kind of a list of the services and technologies we're leveraging. Uh, there's Alandora 8, obviously, OAuth 2, Matomo, and Cube for analytics and reporting, uh, Webflow, React, and a slew of AWS services listed below. Uh, before I hop into that, I'd like to highlight a couple other community projects that are out there. Um, one is Islandora Workbench, which is developed by Mark Jordan at SFU. Uh, Islandora Workbench itself is a Python utility library that does a lot of actions like CRUD utilizing the JSON API in Drupal 8. But he also has Islandora Workbench Desktop, which is an Electron-based app for a decoupled front end, which is actually pretty neat. And that's linked in the resources at the end of this. Another example I'll put out there is uh, Centuro, which used to be a Drupal Commerce Guys. It's a fully decoupled demo where they've decoupled a store and the actions of you know, adding and buying items. So moving on to an actual demo of what we're doing. Hopefully the VPN holds up here. So kind of what we were aiming for was a unified dashboard on our homepage here. Um, you do kind of see that you have some repository metrics like total collections, total objects web traffic pulled in via Matomo, and then a real-time graph of object creation over time. And then, you know, highlighting some recent created collections as well as recent activities in the repository. Um, one thing to note, like Morgan touched on earlier, all of this stuff is componentized. So if we in the future say we want to reorganize how this screen looks, we can kind of just do it as we want. And we can maybe leverage these and other front-end applications. So it's really kind of nifty from a workflow perspective. So the kind of collections overview page is one that you're pretty familiar with if you've looked at repository software, uh, you know, just listing out general collections and things of that nature. Nothing too fancy here. Just gonna have a look at our DGI dogs collection, which is just a collection of employees' dogs at DGI. Uh, 
And again, pretty standard interface where you kind of have your, you know, normal filtering and so on and so forth. Uh, some things to highlight would be, you know, kind of in collection filtering. Again, pretty standard. Um, quickly going to look at the object view. Um, so again, there's kind of more of an autocomplete here as well. And again, this isn't really anything too, too new, but you know, you do kind of have your standard metadata fields where you can do some inline editing to change this, as well as, you know, a details pane with some details about the objects, a list of versions that are existing with the links to each of them, your derivatives, and recent activity for the particular object, and then a danger aptly named to delete an object. Um, this viewer is kind of something that we're, you know, playing with right now. It may not be what we end up using. The highlight again that this is kind of like in flight, in work uh, stuff that we're working on. So nothing here is really finalized. We may rip this out for something like the Universal Viewer or whatever else we want to do. Uh, the last thing I'll show off today will be kind of what we've been doing for the reporting and analytics. And like I mentioned, this is using CubeJS, and Cube allows you to pull in data sources from multiple locations. So in this case, this is hitting a Matomo server to map web traffic. And we're also utilizing uh, Drupal to pull in some information about our repository. Uh, we have to work on the caching a little bit here, but for example, our repository objects creation maps, you know, dates when things are created, the types of objects, and all of this is pulling in real time from the repository. So just kind of click through again, it's pretty standard separation of charts. Um, one kind of neat thing with Cube is it does allow you to build your own charts and dashboards once you have your metrics defined. So that's something that uh, we're pretty excited about. So at this point, it kind of uh, finalizes my overview of what we're doing. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, Melissa, do you take lead on this, or how does this work? Uh yeah, we, uh, folks, you can type your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand if you'd like me to unmute you so you can ask them out loud. Either way it works. How popular is decoupled front ends, says Don Richard. Um, I think they have their place depending on your intended kind of target. Um, I mean, the real benefit, in my opinion, at least for decoupled is kind of getting around to being able to tailor multiple user experiences. Because I think um, Drupal is very, very powerful with what it provides out of the box. But it's powerful if you're kind of the admin end user in mind. And it may be a little overwhelming for someone whose day to day isn't, you know, uh, headlong into, say, repositories and, you know, dealing with the administrative tasks. Mark Jordan says he's done some research that shows that by the time you have 300 right. on a content type, rendering the native ed slash edit node form becomes unusable. How would a decoupled CRUD form handle that many fields? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Mark. And I've had a peek at some of the numbers that you've um, been deriving. So one thing I forgot to mention when I did my overview, and I'll just pull back the presentation here, is, you know, the intent for us when we, you know, finalize this product is to kind of have the ability to pull all the content types and the fields out of Drupal. So right now it's pretty constrained to just a couple for this kind of demo purposes here. Um, with a singular content type and that many fields, I don't think you would ever fully expose all of them to the end user, at least in a targeted sense. Um, on top of that, I know there was some discussion with, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny and Melissa, with one of the upcoming Allendora releases about having multiple content types representing Allendora objects. In that scenario, you could typify them a little bit more uh, and then utilize something like JSON API cross bundles to maybe limit that um, overhead on how many fields are there. Um, honestly, from my uh, diving so far, I don't think we'll personally have a use case uh, for 300 fields on a single type anytime soon. But I, I think you could probably look at mitigating that in a different couple of ways. And if you want to reach out and talk about it, you can hit me up in Slack or something like that. Yeah, or setting up multi-step forms. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, next question. Uh, with multi-site working differently for Island or 8 than it did for Island or 7, could decoupled be used to create a meta repository with all the data and then use decoupled apps to spin out subsites? Yeah, um, I think you could totally see that as a use case, Brian. Um, I'm, I'll be very honest, I'm not familiar with kind of the proposals around how multi-sites are working in Island or 8. Um, but I mean, from Drupal's perspective, let me just open Postman here, I suppose, while it spins off in the background. Um, with Drupal's perspective, if you did have multi-site set up, your JSON API endpoint would kind of respect whatever multi-site you're hitting. Um, or, you know, if you wanted more of a multi-site in the uh, appearance only, you could have a singular, you know, back-end server and then have your front ends be providing those filters to only request particular objects based upon, you know, some field or some kind of metadata denoting, you know, that, hey, I'm a part of A multi-site as opposed to B. I'm not sure if that answers, answers your question. Um, moving on, Oliver, and the last name I can't pronounce, I apologize. What are your experiences with large repositories, say more than 10 million objects? So in terms of decoupled, I would say we don't really have one yet. This is pretty much something that's been, you know, in development uh, by us right now. Um, Architecture-wise, I think it would come down to more so how your backend is handling storage, and whether or not whether or not you're utilizing, say, F3 repo six directly versus some other approaches. Uh, personally, I can say that at least with the couple, we don't have experience with that right now because this is still pretty beta. Uh, Don asks, any examples of a decoupled site in production? Uh, for us, currently not, Don. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, again, Melissa or Danny, there is a few that have been passed around through either the groups or Slack. Um, I don't want to name names in case I get one wrong, um, but I, I do believe there's a couple out there already, Don, and I think UCLA might have done it with a Drupal 7 site even. We might have time for one more question. If, uh... Yeah, and there's one from Brad. Yeah, I think in eight it was Kent State. I might want to say, or maybe it was Alex Kent who had one. It was something along those lines. I apologize for not having that handy. <laughs> um, I will say just to follow up on, say, your question, Don. Um, I see a big. Um, benefit in approaching, say, a decoupled front end for either, you know, creating exhibits of objects you really want to highlight, or even if you're never, like, in my opinion, I don't really see a scenario where you'd ever want to directly expose your back end to the general public, mainly for security reasons and performance. But if you did do something like a static site generator or even a decoupled interface, you're going to be able to easily scale and beef up what you can do for caching. Excellent. Well, that takes us to the hour. So thank you very much, Jordan and Morgan, for demonstrating some really neat ways to decouple Islandora. Yeah, that, that, that dashboard looks super sweet. Comment from the audience that I strongly agree with. And I will uh, send out the recording and these resources and slides to everyone once we've got that all processed. Thank you very much for joining us. And please stay tuned for our May webinar, which we'll be announcing soon. Yep. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us or chat to us in Slack or whatever. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. So one thing I forgot to mention during the webinar was kind of our drag and drop uploader. And it's a little bit non-standard than what you might see out of the box with traditional Drupal or what may have been offered, say, in Islandor 7. Um, this component's likely going to move to use file stack here in the near future, but for the time being, you'll get an idea of what we're trying to go for here, where you drag in a list of your files. And again, these are just the DJI dog collection that I already have. I'm not going to necessarily ingest these at this time, but some of the functionality you can see here is the ability to edit either the individual fields or being able to mass apply, say, some values to some of the items, so some value, we'll say. So 
what this will happen if we were to save this. It'll go add it to the collection that you choose, as well as uploading them in the background while you return to the app. And then finally, it'll go ingest the objects and then create them in the repository. Anyway, thank you very much. I apologize for the omission.